Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, my name is Kevin. I'm going to be talking about the Mesos Replicated log. Um, so one of the, uh, I'm kind of going to be going over a technical report. Uh, this is going to be a case study using Apache Aurora and kind of uh, the experience we've had using this uh, feature of Mesos, which is really awesome, and kind of uh, lessons learned along the way. So as a brief overview, uh, Apache Aurora is a Mesos framework. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on the scheduler portion of it. Um, so this is a Mesos framework that does kind of a general purpose uh, scheduler. So it's a bunch of different types of workloads, long running services, cron jobs, and ad hoc jobs. A long running service like run 100 of these forever, a cron job run some of these on some schedule, and an ad hoc job run one of these, and once it's done, it's done. Uh, and the thing that all of these have in common is that they all get translated, they're higher abstractions over Mesos tasks, bundles of Mesos tasks. So uh, the scheduler is going to have to be really good at managing Mesos tasks. And if you look at the core, kind of the core of what a Mesos scheduler is, what Aurora is, uh, it's kind of a loop that does this. Um, so on the left hand side you have the Aurora scheduler, which is, uh, getting messages from the Mesos master. And this is kind of the conversation that any scheduler is going to be having with the Mesos master. Um, so it's going to get resource offers, launch tasks, and then uh, respond to uh, the, the updates coming from uh, the master forwarded to it by the agents. Um, and finally, acknowledge those status updates so that uh, it stops getting notified about them. And this is really any scheduler. Um, but what makes a reliable scheduler is that in between getting these messages, uh, there's some state that needs to be recorded. Uh, so this is a loop that goes on forever, uh, but in response to, for example, the resource offers uh, message, you need to actually write down, okay, I took this task off my pending queue and I assigned it to this agent. And similarly, uh, when you get a status update, uh, you have to write down, okay, this task was killed, maybe I need to do something with that, uh, maybe I need to create a new task and create, put it in our pending queue. Um, so I need to be able to store the state somewhere. And so Apache Aurora is actually a highly available system. Uh, typical production deployments have three to five schedulers uh, with one leader. And uh, basically the idea is any, the leader can go away at any moment, hardware failure, uh, lightning strike, whatever it is, uh, and then another one can come up and take over and continue scheduling uh, tasks in the cluster. And to do this, um, I need some sort of data store. Now, when we were initially looking for where are we going to put this data store, we saw, aha, we've already got one. Uh, so Mesos, libmesos, uh, which every scheduler is already linking against, comes with the library that uh, contains a Paxos replicated log on top of uh, uh, level DB. So essentially what's happening is uh, the Mesos code is doing all the coordination, the whole Paxos protocol, and uh, using level DB for storage. So we thought, oh, this is a great, this is a great, uh, this is great, it's already built in, so we can, we can use this. Uh, so we did. So uh, each uh, follower also hosts uh, a level DB, uh, a replica, and a kind of like library running process that's going to be uh, coordinating uh, log writes, so running the whole Paxos protocol. And uh, this is great, like we now have highly available storage. Uh, if we have a new scheduler startup, we can uh, restore the state of the world and continue scheduling in that loop. So this is what the Mesos log API looks like. Uh, so Couple things you'll notice, there's basically three operations. I've simplified a little. Um, there's some timeout parameters, um, which are important, but not for this talk. Um, so going over the operations really quickly, there's append. Uh, so you say, I wanna write a new entry to the replicated log. It's an append-only log. And uh, here's the data I want, here's a chunk of data I wanna write there. And then the other operation for write is truncate, as in like, uh, I'm never going to need to read the entries before this position again, so go ahead and delete them. And those, those are the operations that are exposed via the Mesos log API. Uh, there's also a read operation. So uh, the read operation is basically uh, give me all of the entries uh, from some, in some range. And there's also uh, 
functions to get uh, the beginning and end of the log as positions. Um, so when the scheduler starts up, it reads the whole replicated log, reconstructs its state of the world, and uh, continues uh, operating. And then after it's done that, uh, as it's operating, every time it gets one of those messages from the Mesos master, it's going to be doing probably an append operation. And it's also uh, periodically going to be truncating so that it uh, can kind of condense the amount of uh, data that it needs to read when it starts up again. And so one thing you'll notice about this API is it's defined as byte arrays. Uh, so we don't really operate on raw byte arrays all that often. Uh, so we need some sort of uh, layer on top of that, a serialization layer on top of that that's going to control uh, byte arrays. So I have a quick question. How many of you have ever used or heard of Apache Thrift? Fair number, about half the room. Uh, how many of you have, have used it, just used it? Less, less people. So I'm going to give a quick overview of what Apache Thrift is and uh, kind of what you can do with it. So Apache Thrift is an interfa interface definition language um, that you use to define data structures. Um, it's similar to Google's protobuf, very similar in fact. Um, it's similar to JSON, only the major difference is that it's field numbers and not field names that are, that are used as keys to determine the identity of a particular position in a structure. And so we'll see that, why that's important in just a second. Um, so, and uh, another thing that it gives us is the ability to serialize thrift structures into arbitrary, uh, arbitrary different, uh, they're called thrift protocols. So one representation is a binary representation, one representation is a JSON representation. Um, and so we can use this binary representation of thrift, which is a very compact representation, very similar to protobuf, uh, for defining what, the, what we put into the replicated log. Um, and so a quick aside as to why field numbers are important. So Let's say I have this trivial uh, thrift structure, so this is a valid thrift structure. Um, I have a representation of a task, and I have a single string ID that dis defines a task. I might have other fields here, uh, but for the purposes of this, let's say that's, uh, the ID is the only one. And there's a really unfortunate thing about ID here, uh, and that's that uh, it's actually a cluster name, then a magic delimiter, and then uh, a task ID. And we decide, well, this is silly because all the client code has to parse out, uh, parse out these two components if they want to do anything with this. Uh, so we're going to define, we have a better schema. Uh, so the V2 schema is going to be, we're going to write a task ID uh, as the structure instead. So we're going to split up the cluster name and the ID ahead of time so that readers don't have to do it. Um, and so we define this new structure. But unfortunately, we've already got a database that has, uh, that's using the old struct, so we need some way to migrate. Uh, and Thrift actually makes this fairly easy. So what we do is we add a new field to the existing task struct, and we rename the old field uh, to something that makes it clear to the client code that's using it that the old field is deprecated. Now, the binary compatibility hasn't been broken because every field Every task with an ID field, a which is now called deprecated ID field, was written with field ID 1. And every task with a new task ID field, the structural field, has been written, uh, that struct has been written as uh, field number 2. So using this definition, we can create a client that is compatible with both the old and the new way. Uh, so we can have a safe, basically we have a client that can dual write this, writes both, both fields, and uh, you can safely roll back from that client to uh, an, an older client that only understood this, this string ID version. Um, and then later, once you've decided like, okay, like this client has become ubiquitous, like we're not going to support the old version anymore, you can just drop the old field. And the ID version, the non-structural ID version will just die a natural death. Um, and so this is what makes Thrift really useful for schema migrations. So we're going to actually see that in the evolution of Aurora's schema as we uh, use the uh, replicated log to save our data. 
So back to uh, the Mesos Log API. We have this byte array data. So what do we define that byte array data as? We define it as a serialized thrift union. So uh, thrift union is just the uh, same as a C union or a C++ union, or you can think of it as a, uh, uh, an object with many fields and only one of them, at least one and at most one, are set. Um, so our initial version of uh, the Aurora log entry union is going to be uh, three different types of fields. So snapshot, that's the thing that we, we write this, then we truncate the replicated log because a snapshot is sufficient to describe the entire state of a scheduler. And so uh, the scheduler is going to periodically write this snapshot field um, in order to prevent the amount of catch-up work that it has to do when a failover happens when it needs to come back up. And this allows it to remain quick. Uh, quick. Uh, transaction is a incremental change. So uh, operations like set this task ID or create a new task or uh, change this task status from pending to running. These are going to be transactions and you can, uh, it's actually a collection of these operations that get applied or not. Uh, and then no op is uh, an uninteresting implementation detail um, that is kind of a word of how the Mesos API works. Um, so snapshot is the one that I really want to focus a lot on today. Uh, so the problem with snapshot is that it's the entire state of the scheduler. That's also the great thing about snapshot. In fact, Aurora uses, Aurora has its own application level backup that is exactly the same as a snapshot. It's just write it to a file instead of write it to the replicated log. And you can take that and you can put it into a scheduler to restore the scheduler's state. You can put it into a simulator to see like how the scheduler, how a like fake simu uh, simulated workload would would work. Um, you can do uh, uh, analysis on it, just like you could, since it's thrift, you could open it up in the Python REPL. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of power you get from having this like fully described representation of the cluster. Um, so this is great. Unfortunately, it can get really, really big. So if we look into what actually defines a snapshot, it's actually a set of scheduled tasks. Uh, so scheduled task is this uh, struct it basically, it, it contains the entire configuration uh, for every, every task that exists on the cluster as well as its state, its task ID, uh, things like assigned ports that, were, uh, ports that were assigned to it, everything about it, because uh, this is the entire state of the cluster. And this field dominates the size of a snapshot. And when we say it can get big, you might be wondering how big. So this is a recent backup from one of Twitter's production Aurora clusters. So this is uh, du-sm, which is megabytes. So that's a 1.5 gigabyte snapshot file. So if we attempted to append 1.5 gigabytes to the log, it'll work, but it takes a really long time. And because of the way the scheduler works, uh, it can't actually do any work while it's trying to just stop the world and checkpoint its state. Um, so, this is kind of a problem. So we didn't start here, and uh, we didn't get to uh, we didn't get to this point uh, without having a plan. So when we started to see this become a bottleneck uh, a few years ago, we realized that uh, we have a byte array, and uh, we could just make it a smaller byte array. So we uh, introduced a new field to the union called a deflated entry, and a deflated entry is just uh, another serialized log entry that's had the deflate compression algorithm applied to it. So kind of a simple black box solution. Um, we saw fairly good, uh, good speed up from that. Uh, so the equivalent, uh, this is the shell equivalent of what the scheduler Java code does, which is just apply gzip to the input file. And basically gzip doesn't know anything about how thrift is encoded, doesn't know anything about the application structure. And it gets it down pretty good. It's down to 296 megabytes, which uh, is still quite a lot of data. So once we got, uh, so we continued growing, um, we eventually got to hundreds of thousands of tasks, and uh, that was no longer enough. Uh, so we were still spending way too much time uh, compressing. We were spending a ton of time, we are spending a ton of CPU time compressing too, because the, as the input data gets bigger and you're using black box compression techniques, you're not going to see, um, it, you're just going to necessarily spend a lot of CPU time on that. 
Um, and even using uh, other faster compression algorithms, we experimented with like LZO, for example, and uh, kind of saw the same thing. Like we weren't getting, it wasn't getting the compression ratio we wanted and the uh, CPU time that we were spending doing it was uh, a huge cost as well. So this leads us to the second solution, which is normalization. So normalization is the, basically the don't repeat yourself principle applied to databases. So uh, we wanted to go through uh, this giant uh, piece, this giant snapshot that we're writing and find where we're writing any sort of duplicated data. And uh, so we introduced this new field called deduplicated snapshot. So where did we find duplicated data? So looking in, going back to the uh, definition of a snapshot, we actually, so everything is a set of uh, scheduled tasks. So what's in a scheduled task, uh, an assigned task? What's an assigned task? Well, we have two things. We have the globally unique Mesos task ID, so that's not gonna, that's gonna be different for everyone. And we have this structure called task config. Now task config happens to be all of the information that's passed on to the executor. Um, it's essentially the template by which tasks are created. Um, what this means is that uh, if you had a uh, service that consisted of a thousand instances, um, chances are task config is exactly the same, and I mean byte for byte exactly the same for all 1,000 of them. Uh, so we found this, and this is kind of defined as thrift, so it was kind of fairly obvious, or it was kind of fairly uh, natural to embed this field as a thrift field, um, but it turns out to be a tremendous amount of duplicated data. So, what we did is write a deduplication function, which just uh, quickly checks to see whether uh, basically puts uh, task configs into a map as the key in a map and a multi-map that uh, has a uh, list, of, uh, list of tasks that they correspond to. So we essentially implemented kind of a foreign key constraint like after the fact, because the data was already structured this way. And so what we came up with is this deduplicated sna snapshot struct, which is the uh, composition of this de new deduplicated task struct, which is exactly everything that scheduled tasks contains minus the task config, that field is nulled out, as well as an index. And that index is just an index, uh, it's a pointer into this second list below, this uh, list of task configs. And with that, uh, we were able to get a pretty good compression ratio and it's faster because it's application level, you're not having to do um, deflate against, basically use a general purpose compression algorithm when an application specific one will work and what we found is that uh, we got a pretty good compression ratio here as well. So we went from 1.5 gigabytes to 281 megabytes. Um, but the great thing about this solution is they're composable. So if we do both, we get down to 44 megabytes, which is, while still big, uh, fairly compact for hundreds of thousands of tasks. Doesn't take all that long to write over the network and uh, kind of a reasonable compromise given the complexity we're doing. Um, if we get past the point where this is a feasible size, um, then we're at the point where we need to do a whole lot more work just to continue to operate this cluster. And going back to this uh, scheduling loop, this is, uh, the conclusion is that a performant a performant database is really, really important for this loop to be fast because every single uh, message you get from the master, you can't respond to it until you've actually written data to whatever data store you're using. Um, and you're essentially stuck having to implement a database, uh, take care of these, these concerns uh, in order to make a really performance scheduler. So the conclusion is that a performance scheduler needs a very performant database. So you might as well start with a performant database and not essentially write your own um, as we 
did on top of the Mesos replicated log API. Um, the other conclusion is that normalization is really important, and it turns out there's already kind of a way of describing uh, really well normalized data and enforcing that it uh, remains consistent, and that's SQL. So the conclusion we drew is that Aurora, the Aurora scheduler had essentially more and more code dedicated to essentially implementing a distributed database. Um, and that's not really uh, the fault. Uh, it kind of like evolved out of the system uh, in kind of a like natural way. But looking back at the steps we took, the optimizations we made, it's fairly clear that we were just implementing a new database. Um, so the uh, takeaway is this is what the definition of a, ta of a the, the equivalent of an assigned task looks like in the uh, Aurora SQL database. And uh, it's a fairly good tool, so this references task configs ID says, I'm not storing this data here, but I have a reference to it, and the reference will be enforced by the underlying system, and you can just rely on that. Uh, now, the question is, uh, how do we get kind of the uh, the other properties, the high availability, the uh, sort of ease of deployment, because remember, uh, Mesos already came with uh, this replicated log, so we now need a new deployment component. Uh, and that's, that's the point where Aurora is right now, is we really want to, we want to retain the ease of deployment, but we've recognized that there's already a tool for the job that we're trying to do. Um, and so uh, with that, I, we've got about eight minutes for questions, uh, if anyone in the audience has questions. Yes? Yes, it is. Yes, that's tr that's true. Oh, sorry. The question was uh, the uh, log entry struct has another uh, field defined, another struct defined called transaction, and was is there an opportunity for uh, is task config denormalized there? And the answer is yes, it is. So the question is, why did we pick Thrift? Uh, so the answer to this is, uh, the, there's another piece of Thrift that uh, is fairly widely used. So Aurora began as a project at Twitter. Um, there's another piece of Thrift that's fairly widely used, which is it actually defines service RPC stubs for you. So in addition to just like those data structures, it also lets you define like an interface that will compile it into a client and a server in different languages. Um, Protobuf, I believe, has that now, but didn't at the time that uh, that uh, the Aurora project was incepted. Question there? Uh, so the question was, uh, the HTTP API has been announced for, uh, as a replacement for the Mesos. Um, will we be adopting the HTTP API when that comes out? Um, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, we may actually be looking at moving off of the storage portion of the, the Mesos API sooner. Um, I don't know of any immediate plans to completely remove uh, the ability to run a, a scheduler linked with libmesos, um, but we've certainly been uh, in favor of having fewer uh, native dependencies. Uh, basically, it kind of complicates the, the whole build 
uh, and deploy process for not only the scheduler but the executor as well uh, and having the ability to use like standard libraries standard language native libraries uh, in order to do like our RPC layer would significantly uh, improve the kind of debugability reliability and kind of just like uh, consistency of the actual code base I think question Great question. So the question is, uh, Zookeeper already exists inside of Mesos, uh, most of the Mesos infrastructure. What was the reason for using yet another consensus system? Um, so I'm going to start off by answering that Aurora does use Zookeeper uh, for leader election and service discovery, which are kind of two use cases that Zookeeper is extremely good for. So um, leader election being uh, deciding which of the three schedulers is going to be leader at the time and the other two are going to sit idle and wait for that one to go away. Service discovery being uh, announcement of like uh, once, once the leader has won the election, um, going into uh, Zookeeper and creating an entry that says uh, this is my essentially host, host and port. Uh, we also use it for um, the replicated log itself uses Zookeeper for discovery, but not for consensus. Uh, as to why not use Zookeeper, uh, as the kind of storage layer. Um, the feedback we've gotten from people who have run, and we've also run Zookeeper at a pretty good scale, is that um, the, that Zookeeper is not a database. In fact, we've, uh, it's not a general purpose database. Um, so essentially, like, the, the amount of data that we're storing is probably, uh, is likely to hit a bottleneck. For example, uh, a Z node in Zookeeper takes, uh, has a one megabyte uh, limit. There is code in Aurora to uh, another log entry type that I didn't mention, uh, which is a frame and a frame, and there's a frame header and frame chunk, so essentially like you could split up these into uh, under the underlying, uh, in order to fit into whatever the underlying storage's uh, size is, um, but we haven't seen uh, good performance for Zookeeper with that use case in our production environments. Does that answer the question? Back there. How do we decide when to truncate the log? So currently, um, it's tuned, uh, there's a default, I think, once every hour, just everything, uh, there's, a, there's a truncation operation. Um, it's, uh, currently just like a it's a tunable. So we could have chosen, it's time based right now, we could have chosen like after every n entries, truncate the log, it's really just uh, arbitrary, or it's a not arbitrary, but like uh, monitoring driven choice what that value is. Anyone else? Great, well thank you all for coming out. Um, uh, the last, last word, uh, if you're interested in Apache Aurora, uh, you can follow us on Twitter, join us on IRC, and uh, check us out on the uh, Apache Foundation website. Thank you very much.